going to read you, and I'll, you can read this, uh, and uh, I'm going to read you what it says. It's a beautiful thing to read, and your task is to work out who might have said it or written it. What are the pangs of a mother when she hears the moanings of her infant that, during the agony of disease, cannot express what it feels? In her idea of what it suffers, she joins to its real helplessness her own consciousness of that helplessness and her own terrors for the unknown consequences of its disorder. And out of these forms the most complete image of misery and distress. The infant, however, feels only the uneasiness of the present instant, which can never be great. With regard to the future, it is perfectly secure, and in its thoughtlessness and want of foresight, possesses an antidote against fear and anxiety, the great tormentors of the human breast, from which reason and philosophy will, in vain, attempt to defend it when it grows up to the man. Who do you think might have written that? Well, it's the same person who wrote that, and you may recognise that. Uh, Adam Smith, the father of modern economics, wrote, People of the same trade seldom meet together except for merriment, even for merriment and diversion, that the conversation ends in a conspiracy against the public. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about public, the public goods of the 21st century, and I'm going to use my close personal friend Adam Smith as my <laughs> tour guide, just because modern economists really don't get it. Um, that's a textbook example of a, of a public good. That's an indefinition of a public good, uh, something that the government has to build because markets won't do it. The reason markets won't do it is because the public good is non-excludable. So think of, uh, think of the uh, lighthouse. Uh, a ship can take advantage of the light whether it pays a toll or not. That's non-excludable, and that's why economists regard public goods as a problem. But there's another characteristic of public goods, which is that they're non-rivalrous. And uh, Thomas Jefferson helps us understand what non-rivalrousness is and why it is one hell of an opportunity. Thomas was fresh from the blogging revolution of the 18th century, <laughs> which was called pamphlets at the time. And he understood that ideas are free and that ideas can <coughs> make us free uh, because you can pass them on and build on them and so on and so forth. So, the, the, so, so here's our tour guide, Adam Smith, and of course he's famous for having written a book called The Wealth of Nations, which if you like is about private goods. Um, he also wrote 17 years beforehand a book called The Theory of Moral Sentiments, which is about the evolution of human culture. It tries to explain using a single explanation, which I'll get onto, how it is that we can all be in this room peacefully sharing things, generally purposeful, uh, understanding what the purpose of what we're doing is. We're not trying to steal from each other. We're not trying to take advantage of each other. How does that, how does that arise uh, since we can also see that there are aspects of our nature which are quite self-interested. The uh, thing is, governments didn't build that public good that is, has us in this room peaceful and purposeful. Uh, and in fact, there is a thing in our life which is a public good, which is the quintessential human public good. It made us, and I've never seen it in an economics textbook, and the government didn't build it that Adam Smith wrote a short treatise on the evolution of language. And he explained the evolution of markets and the evolution of culture and the evolution of language in exactly the same way, which is that people are going about their own business and out of this miraculously comes some collective public good, order without design. Charles Darwin nicked the idea in the next century and the world hasn't been the same. So the way I look at the world, having thought about this and read Adam Smith and just kind of ruminated on it, is that there is a fractal ecology of public and private goods. Um, we, in this room, there are public goods, there are private goods. We know that each of us have our own private interest. 
Football teams are incredibly competitive with each other, but internally they're obsessed with solidarity, competition and so on. Within families, it's the same thing. So, ladies and gentlemen, that is what the world is built of, this very complex ecology. That's not what you read in an economics textbook. It's not what you hear on the news about public and private goods. And we have an image in our mind about what drives progress, and it tends to be a kind of market-driven idea. But if we look at economic, just purely economic progress, we find that as we progress, we evolve new public goods. And I don't know what you would do if you were looking for a hat to represent the 18th century, but that was the best I could do. And in the 18th century, uh, we had central banking. Uh, we, we, we had all this investment in ships, but they kept getting lost because they didn't know what longitude they were in, and the, and the sailors on them got scurvy. And those things were far more important to solve than more competition between more shipbuilders. And we had joint stock companies. So those, so those are some of the public goods that we evolved in the 18th century. And in the 19th century, I guess you could say that the top hat is a kind of public good in itself, but we <laughs> invented public education, public sanitation, a public service that sat exams and was chosen on merit. That was an idea that from in England in 1854 from the Chinese who'd been doing it for a thousand years, uh, central banknotes, about which I could uh, regale you at some <laughs> length, but I don't have time. <laughs> so, 21st century, uh, what are the public goods of the 21st century? Well, firstly, the most important thing is what kind of hat am I going to put there? <laughs> um, it just wasn't going to do, so that was the best I could do uh, with the hat and probably only the people at the front uh, know that it says keep calm and focus on the 21st century. That was the best I could do. But these are some of the public goods of the 21st century. Google, Wikipedia, open source software, and none of them were built by the government. So we actually, the other thing is we actually have to redefine what a public good is because these things, ladies and gentlemen, actually are excludable, but Google uh, Wikipedia, Facebook, Twitter choose not to exclude them. Now, considering that three of those four companies are for profit, profit, something remarkable is happening. They are choosing to make the good available as a public good, not a private good. On the back of my envelope, Google uh, generates <coughs> about a trillion dollars of economic value each year. And its calculation is that it can, if it can get some lousy 6% of that value, it's going to make $60 billion a year in revenue. Nice work if you can get it, and a lot nicer work than it could get by, by charging subscriptions and providing the thing as a private good. So the free rider opportunity, you've never heard that expression because we all spend our time worrying about the free rider problem, which also exists, the free rider opportunity has gone berserk uh, ever since, uh, uh, just progressively since uh, since uh, Thomas Jefferson started talking about it, and we've changed our definition of uh, of um, public goods to public goods that are non-rivalrous and non-excluded, whether they're excludable or not. So we now, I, my landscape of public goods has traditional public goods on this side, and on this side, emergent public goods. Language, uh, here is an extraordinary thing, open source software, the language instinct rendered into executive code, and if that doesn't get the hair on the back of your neck standing up, well, <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> uh, and then all these other, all these other goods which, are, which, which we populate and turn into public goods uh, once someone has built a platform and shown the business skill to get us along. So if you think about this, these are public goods that built themselves and there must be a really big space, which I've just made room for on those slides, where there are digital public goods to be had but they can't sort of spring themselves into existence via philanthropy like uh, Wikipedia or via advertising and for-profit like Google, Twitter, and Facebook. 
what do they look like and are there any killer uh, is, things that is this a sort of a nice little game I'm playing or is it a big opportunity uh, well I spent a good while looking for this killer app in this space and then I was in San Francisco in 2012 there's Anne Wojcicki the founder of 23andMe and uh, a co-founder of 23andMe, then married to Sergey Brin, the founder of Google, things move fast in Silicon Valley, uh, and she founded 23andMe. 23andMe for $99 will do a genomic sequence of you, a partial genomic sequence. When I saw her, she had 170,000 uh, customers and I thought, honey, I've got to, have I got a deal for you? This is a something that should be a public good and should be a public-private partnership with Medicare. Medicare should bulk bill it. Doctors should say, do you want this? The health system could have the genome. You don't have to agree to this if you don't want to, but the health system gets the genome, which it can use to improve diagnosis in research, pharmacovigilance, work it out, and so on. <laughs> Uh, and put us in the driver's seat to start personalised medicine. An incredible thing, I think, and there are lots of other examples like that. Uh, so, uh, uh, something else about the public goods of the 21st century. Um, Adam Smith tells us, sorry, we're now going back, oh dear, that's not the 21st century, that's the 21st century. Adam Smith tells us that we need social capital, and social capital is damaged in all sorts of places in our society, so that's a problem. The other problem is that lemons cure a lack of vitamin C, but lemons do not cure a lack of social capital. We actually don't know how to do this. So where should we be looking? Well, the, one, of the, one of the problems is that in economics, we think we're dealing with something very tangible when we, look at, when we think about self-interest. Um, and the, the drivers of social capital are more subtle, but they're no less strong, and it's a huge mistake to, for us to think that they are. Uh, so I'm going to show you two videos. The first is the positive side of social capital. The second is how we can enforce fairness or how we have a natural desire to enforce fairness. So there's the, here's the first video. Jessica, nine months old, gets to watch a puppet show. Okay, here we go. While the striped puppet seems to want to play ball, Green Jacket is having none of it. Here we go. Orange Jacket, on the other hand, is happy to join in. See? Hi. Who do you like? That one! Good job! That was the nice bunny! <laughs> that was really good good job! In many similar experiments with babies only a few months old, the infants almost always choose the cooperating puppet. One thing that's clearly true of the human species is that we're a profoundly cooperative social species, where cooperation is necessary, uh, to survival and where mutual cooperation is required and the ability to detect mutual cooperators and also to detect those who are not cooperating. And speaking of not cooperating, here is a, an experiment with two <coughs> monkeys and fairness. There's the monkey who gets cucumber. The one on the right is the one who gets grapes. The one who gets cucumber, note that the first piece of cucumber is perfectly fine. The first piece she eats. Uh, then she sees the other one getting grape and you will see what happens. So she gives a rock to us, that's the task, and we give her a piece of cucumber and she eats it. The other one needs to give a rock to us, and that's what she does, and she gets a grape, and she eats it. The other one sees that, she gives a rock to us now, gets again cucumber. <laughs> <laughs> Give it to us. And she gets cucumber again. 
<laughs> so you can see there is not it's not the case it's not the case that there isn't strong that there isn't a strong uh, drivers behind social capital. So here's um, here is uh, our friend, our tour guide, Adam Smith again, and he's telling us that people of the same trade never seldom meet except that a conspiracy turns against the public. Let me tell you how I now understand that, which is that uh, professions, uh, any profession, uh, tends to have the same problem. And I'm not just talking about lawyers and specialists driving their fees up, I'm talking about uh, uh, professions that are built on helping people. Professions like social work. Here is Mystique. Uh, this is a contemporary story. She was taken from her parents who weren't looking after her at the age of three and at the age of 18 uh, was simply thrown out, uh, given a book and a few things and not only got thrown out of institutional care but told not to contact any of the people she had learnt to grow, to, 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 to love her friends uh, because she was now a risk to the system. So systems have a way of, of, their, of, of, their, of their logic tyrannising the people that they're actually supposed to be helping. I did a Google search of putting people at the centre of everything we do and there are 2,000 hits on that exact expression. Everybody says this but in fact doing it is very difficult. And at the Australian Centre for Social Innovation, we have tried to do this. And one of the most important disciplines is the discipline represented here. Does anyone know what discipline this person comes from? I suspect some people in this audience will. He's a designer and he's checking out what happens when you go to a hospital. Uh, and what do you think he sees when he plays the tape back to himself? Well, this is what he says. Who knew? Sorry, that shouldn't be there. <laughs> um, so, so we have. Uh, so, so this is so, so. So the way I, I I encountered design as a as an economist, and I thought, okay, so what design is is it's a kind of counter narrative. It's a discipline of being cross disciplinary. But the thing I want to focus on is it is it tries. It, it, it's a discipline based on the idea that making the journey to the other is actually worthy of a discipline all of itself, that it's a hard thing to do. And, uh, in, and indeed, I want to quote Adam Smith again, because you will be familiar with this quote as a quote which embodies self-interest. And Smith's point is exactly the opposite, that in a well-functioning market, the, you don't it isn't in your interest to focus on your interest because the butcher, the baker and the brewer don't care about you. You have to address yourself, you have to figure out what they want uh, rather, uh, in order for them, to, for them to give you what you want. And uh, so, uh, so that's, that's Smith's approach to a market. And here is a list of things that was of characteristics of design. And uh, this is design, uh, th th this really struck me that the, key, that the key thing about design, the engine behind design, is empathy. Uh, and sure enough, when Adam Smith was writing his two books, he was writing according to the Newtonian method. A, a great fan of Adam, of, of of uh, Isaac Newton, the theory of gravity connects up the whole world from a single proposition, and the theory of moral, uh, the, 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 the uh, wealth of nations tries to do that with a single principle of human beings' tendency to truck, barter, and exchange. And guess what builds sympathy? Uh, sorry, guess get, guess what builds this culture? Uh, sympathy. And by sympathy, he didn't actually mean sort of lovey doveyness he meant the fact that we cannot know anything about another unless and until we imagine ourselves in their position. And that's how social knowledge works. So at Taxi, we have tried to use disciplines of business, design and co-design, and social science to build social programs. 
we frame assumptions, we are in the office and out of the office we test them and it goes on and on and on. We build a program called Family by Family. Family by Family links f uh, one family to another, uh, but it does much more, uh, but, but it isn't just a nice idea that we had, it's an idea that we worked over with families for months and months and months. We prototyped certain things, we asked them whether this worked, whether that worked. It's what I call ch uh, the, the social scientist not as obstetrician but as midwife, if you like. Someone who's trying to bring out knowledge which is already there, trying to make that journey to the other. Family by family, and I will end with a video uh, of just to give you an idea of how powerful it is. Uh, the other thing I want to say is that it isn't just mentoring, it's mentoring with a coach in the background, a whole program that takes the families through the process. So knowledge is going in there, but it's going in there as midwife, not as boss, not as obstetrician. Uh, here is the software of family by family. It doesn't say you've got a problem, your kids are not going to school. It says what are your objectives in the main bubble and then what are three things which will help deliver that objective and what are three things which will get better as you achieve that objective. Uh, so I will now let you see the video uh, and I think it speaks uh, for itself. Family by Family is one of the most inspiring approaches to assisting very vulnerable families, families going through a tough time, that I've come across in four decades. Lots of people are in that bit where they're trying to get through it and they can't get out the other side so you can kind of go, you know what, I did this, I've been here, I've done that, I can actually get out, I can help you get out the other side, it can be done, it's not a completely hopeless situation. And I think that's mostly what sharing families have to offer, I think, is just themselves and their stories and their life. Linda and her family, they were going through a really hard time. They were at risk of having their family separated by having the children removed from the home. 27 notifications in, in the last three years before this year. What we saw was a very sad, depressed family. There was a lot of confusion happening. They wanted to take the kids till they were 18. I went through court for three months. How can we help with this? Because we're just as dysfunctional as the next family. But then we realised that we'd actually learnt a lot of things that, um, that, that we could really help Linda with. Michelle and David have just coaxed me along and fantastic to go through court having the support behind me and not losing my kids. I'm looking at a happier future with my kids. I'm Sue, I'm a seeking family. I'm a single parent with four children. My nine-year-old son has some special needs. He was too young for it to be labelled, so it got labelled as um, developmental delays, which is an umbrella thing. Yeah. Since then, I've been um, knocking on doors and, 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 you know, screaming and crying and whatever uh, for help. We have guest speakers giving us training, for example, from Autism SA. Um, that was particularly significant with Sue because I was able to pass on that information. Instead of me telling me, no, I'm useless, I'm this, that and the other, I've got someone saying, no, you are a good mum, you, you do do a good job, you know. So it's just, yeah, that helps immensely. Just seeing her come alive, the way that she holds herself compared to the way that she did when I first met her is just, yeah, she actually, you know, stands tall and, and smiles. Now life is as, it's just going to get better. It's as good as it can get for me at the moment, I believe, you know. Giving us hope of a new way of reaching out to troubled families drawing on the strengths that exist in other families. Thank you very much.